and welcome to our second Zoom uh, Lothian Scottish Wildlife Trust meeting. Um, we had a very successful meeting last month and I'm hoping that we'll have the same again this month. Uh, this week, we or this month, we uh, I'd like to introduce Catherine Grierson, who is going to give us a talk about birds and wildlife in the Falkland Islands. Uh, Catherine is a, a long-standing Lothian Scottish Wildlife Trust member. Uh, she's got a keen interest in local and Scottish wildlife, particularly birds and badgers, but I'm a I'm led to believe there's no badgers in uh, the Falklands, but we'll find out about that shortly. She's also a keen amateur photographer, especially on wildlife holidays. And as a result of my uh, request at last month's meeting for a talk for November, Catherine came forward and said she would like to give us a talk about a, a wildlife holiday trip she took to the Falkland Islands and show us some of the wildlife down there. And we thought that would be a very useful and very interesting talk, given that it'd be a nice contrast, given that the topography in the Falklands is very similar to what we've got in Scotland. Edinburgh is 55, 56 degrees north. Stanley is about 52 degrees south. So similar in terms of latitude. So I'm going to pass over to um, Catherine and have her give a talk about the wildlife in the Falklands. Over to you, Catherine. Okay, thank you, Alan. Good evening, everybody. I will first do the technology bit and hopefully share my screen successfully. Thank you, Nick, for nodding. Um, this time last year, we were fortunate enough to be in the Falklands Islands to see the islands and their wildlife in their spring particularly the birds and the marine mammals. There are actually very few mammals at all, Alan, uh, in the Falkland Islands. Uh, so I think this is all birds and marine mammals in this one. Little did we know what would happen in the meantime. I understand the Falkland Islands don't expect any visitors at all this year. And that includes the many cruise ships that would normally dock en route to the Antarctic. Their tourist season is effectively cancelled with all of the resulting economic implications. On a brighter note, a year ago tonight, about five, 45 minutes ago, I think, we were lucky enough to see this fellow, our fifth species of penguin for the day on one island, something very rare, but much more of that later. The Falkland Islands are an internally self-governed overseas territory of the UK. Their national flower is the Pale Maiden, seen here in a garden in Stanley, the capital. It is an archipelago in the South Atlantic, around 310 miles northeast of South America, 625 miles north of Elephant Island, and 900 miles west of South Georgia. But it is a very special place and presents an opportunity to see some of the Antarctic wildlife without having to face the dreaded Drake's Passage. The Falklands are made up of two islands, East and West Falkland, plus about 750 offshore islands. Don't worry, I'm not attempting to talk about all of them, just to concentrate on the five offshore islands we visited, which were Carcass, West Point, Pebble, Bleaker and Sea Lion, plus the King Penguin Colony up at Volunteer Point on East Falkland. I won't be able to cover all of the wildlife on the archipelago or on any island, but just to give a flavour of each. In addition to the wildlife, there are some half a million sheep on the islands, as wool remains the main land-based export. On our first day, we detoured via the shearing sheds at Goose Green, which is one of the largest in the Southern Hemisphere. We were looking for a barn owl that usually roosts there, but as the shearing was in full flow, it had very sensibly departed. The mainly Australian shearers follow the shearing season, which is pretty difficult to say, around the world and were very fast. 
The Falkland Islands' own team competed at international sharing competitions and have been at our own Highland show. The Fal as, as Alan just said, the Falkland archipelago is a similar distance from the equator in the southern hemisphere as the UK is in the northern. The countryside has distinct similarities with the Scottish islands, such as the Outer Hebrides and the Shetlands. Some of the flora is very similar, such as the gorse shown here with an austral thrush, a bit different to what we get, but an endemic subspecies of the Falklands. Or the diddle dee, which in a sense is their equivalent of our heather. And funnily enough, up on the hillside, it looks remarkably similar. Although in season, it has red berries, which can be used to make jam. And it's always windy, just like my experience of the islands, to various degrees. Andy, our guide, suggested taking a photo of a limp windsock at the first internal insult, airstrip. I thought he was joking. But no, that must have been the only time the wind wasn't blowing to some extent all fortnight. The only practical way to travel between the islands on a trip such as this is by plane. These, the islanders, are operated by Fygast, Falkland Island Government Air Service. I understand it's the same type of plane that Logan Air operates in the Orkney Islands. Our first trip, as mentioned, was to be to Corcus Island up on the northwest, which would take about an hour. However, there was first a delay of a couple of hours to let the fog clear. Does that feel familiar? We were a group of seven, always split over two planes with Bill and I on the second flight. The pilot explained that he was taking a slightly wider route, avoiding some of the turbulence that day. That went perfectly well and we landed comfortably on the grass runway. The other plane landed on the second grass runway, as some of the islands do have two to allow for differing wind conditions. We were then asked if we drove. So Bill drove the second vehicle over to the other runway and consequently became our second off-road driver for the rest of the time on the island as it was much com more comfortable to take two vehicles. And I forgot to show him. Carcass Island is just over six miles long and up to a mile and a half wide. It takes its name from HMS Carcass, which visited in the late 18th century. It's a working sheep farm, but has been managed with wildlife in mind, so retains a rich diversity. Amongst other attractions, it has large sandy beaches, as you can see, and mature tussock grass, which we can see there. I don't know if anybody else will agree, but this view, taken on a lovely morning heading for the boat, reminded me of Plockton, with the New Zealand cabbage plants in the bay. And so to the first penguins, and appropriately, the Gentoo, which is resident throughout the year and the largest common penguin in the Falkland Islands, second in size only to the king. There are something like 100 sites around the coast of the islands, with some 132 pairs in total. They nest in colonies on the ground, as here, making nests from the diddle dee, grasses and stones. The colony denudes the ground and so moves a little bit each year to a new patch. The adults are quite distinctive with the white bar on the crown of the head and the long orange and back black beak. The colony can easily be a mile from the sea and is always active at this time of year. When one partner is left to brood the eggs while the other heads to the sea to clean up, as these guys look fairly dirty, and feed. They take traditional communal paths, thus rather than head directly to the sea from their nest, they walk through and round the colony to take the usual path with the others. After feeding and returning to the beach, they chill out for a while. I have to say watching this, it just looked to me like people trying to put off going back to the chores. They then return to the colony, again via the communal paths, as the penguin reaches the colony, it starts to call and it appears to listen for its mate and then follows the responding call to its mate on the nest. The pair then bond 
before swapping brooding duties. The aim being to expose the eggs for as little time as possible. There were also a large number of Magellanic penguins. These are a numerous summer resident, widespread on the islands. It is a burrowing penguin, which is very shy and likely to retreat into the burrow if you approach. It returns to the same burrow in the same colony each year, although ownership, I believe, is sometimes disputed. The burrow can also be in the tussock grass. We also saw our first elephant seals at the archipelago's second largest colony. These are the world's largest seal. As the beach masters and females have largely left by this time, the main activity is the younger males testing their strength on land and in the sea. This year's young are also there in abundance as they have in effect been fed to bursting point and then left to fend for themselves until they're ready to go to the sea. The youngsters have unbelievably sweet faces for such a large animal. Carcass, like other islands, has lots of interesting fauna and flora. This includes all of the Falkland Islands endemic species unique to the islands. Two of these are here. First is the cockerel, seen here taking insects from a very old whale skeleton. This bird was named after a local farmer, an amateur ornithologist, as a specimen was found on Carcass Island around 100 years ago. And the steamer duck, seen here amongst as yet unflowering sea cabbage. That's probably the one slight disappointment about going at this time of year is that most things aren't yet flowering. The, the, the only endemic or native butterfly isn't yet out. There are also many endemic subspecies on the archipelago though, and that includes the sedren, which is sitting here on native pig vine, the austral thrush, which is again on gorse, seemed to be its favourite place to be sitting. The white bridled finch, and here it's picking through the sheep's sorrel. Although this is an introduced plant, it's a very important one as it reduces erosion. There's the long-tailed meadowlark, which is known locally as the robin, and the kelp goose. Although it was not yet nesting, the conspicuous white male who would be standing nearby to a nest would have made nests easy to spot. In addition, the island has a number of residents which can be found elsewhere, not just on the archipelago, such as the beautiful black chin siskin and two oyster catchers, the blackish, named for obvious reasons, and the Magellanic, which is similar to our own, although a different subspecies. There were two nests actually already with eggs close by. We also found some Falkland lavender, but yes, unfortunately it too was too early in the season for the flowers. So on a lovely morning, we took a day ship over to West Point Island. Although being close to Carcass, it is actually also off the Northwest Point of West Falkland. It's a working farm, although now heavily dependent on tourism and the cruise ship trade. It was previously known as Albatross Island, probably as a result of its large breeding colony of black-browed albatross. These are located on the Devil's Nose, a rocky promontory on the sandstone cliffs on the west side of the island. These beautiful birds get their name from a black line over and through the eye. They also have a pink and yellow bill and are silent in flight. They literally just glide past you. But they do make a loud braying call when they're courting and returning to the nest. And being so early in the season, we were privileged to see some of their courting behavior. The nest itself is reused annually. It's a solid pillar up to 20 inches tall of mud, guano, with some grass or seaweed, and into which a single egg is laid in October. These birds are known for being amazingly laid back at the nest. 
And previous ringing here suggests that they may be able to live for up to 50 years in favorable conditions. Nesting alongside are some 500 pairs of southern rockhopper penguins. This is a smallish colony, but very approachable as you are partly hidden in the tussock grass. Of the penguins on the Falklands, the rockhopper is the smallest at about 22 inches and most agile. It is most recognisable by its thin yellow eyebrows ending in yellow plumes which hang above and behind the eyes, as we can see here. There are summer visitors returning in September to the same breeding grounds, often the same nest and seeking out the same partner with whom they will then bond and mate before laying their eggs. They normally lay two eggs but generally only one, the second, survives to hatch. The Falkland Islands has one of the largest populations of southern rockhopper penguin in the world, about 320,000. However, per National Geographic, the colonies have declined considerably here, as elsewhere. Some estimates suggest by as much as 30% in the last 30 years of the 20th century. The waters around the islands are also popular with dolphins. While eating our lunch, this pod of five Peel's, do Peel's dolphin appeared below, including a youngster swimming with mum. It is a robust dolphin with a monochrome beak, white and gray body pattern, and it has a tall recurved dorsal fin. The Comiston's dolphin, on the other hand, is the smallest dolphin at around five foot. This has a characteristic low dorsal fin and quite distinct black and white colouring. It is regularly found while riding boats. Indeed, that's how we came across this one, which was part of a group of nine who were bow riding the boat back from West Point. And two of them followed the dinghy right up to the landing area. We then moved on to Pebble Island. Pebble Island is named after the unusual translucent semi-precious stones found on some of its beaches. It has varied habitats, including dunes and rocky shores with low cliffs. This can be backed by undulating heathland with large ponds. There are also three peaks or mountains, although as none of them are over a thousand feet, perhaps in Scotland we would struggle to think of them as mountains. Here there's the southern Karakara sitting in the foreground. Pebble also has the longest sand beach in the Falklands at about four miles. This doubles as the island's second runway, a bit like Papa Westry. I don't know if that's the reason, but there wasn't much wildlife on it, just some waders. I think, that, I think they're all oyster catchers, actually. However, it does make up for that elsewhere. As the smaller beaches have lots of penguins, in particular, coming and going from the various colonies. You might notice in this photo that one of the penguins is not yet clean and instead of going into the sea has turned around and come back with some of the birds coming out. I have no idea why they do this but we saw it on a number of occasions. Although each time the bird would eventually turn around again on the beach and go into the water. A few of the Gentoo nests were slightly more advanced on Pebble and so gave us our first chicks. These two chicks here were actually quite active and being fed. Again, we had the Falkland steamer duck, which is one of the endemic birds of the island. 
These can be flying or non-flying. And I'm reliably informed that the only way to tell them apart is to approach and see if they fly. Needless to say, we didn't, so I don't know which these are. We were also able to see the colony of southern giant petrel. These were nesting on a coastal slope. Although it is quite an aggressive bird, it is very sensitive to disturbance at the nest. Hence, we didn't approach and watch them from a distance. The southern giant petrel is, however, a very large bird with a wingspan of up to 81 inches and is a rather aggressive scavenger. As I mentioned already, there are large ponds in the heathland on Pebble, which provides habitat for numerous birds. This includes these displaying silvery grebe, which get their name from the shining white foreneck. These grebe nest colonially with up to 20 pairs together, although we only saw a few here. There was also the white tufted grebe, which has a noticeable crimson eye. It normally makes a solitary nest of floating weeds. And although we didn't see it, I assume its partner would have been on or building the nest close by. There were silvery, silver teal with their pale cheeks and blue bill. It is a resident here nesting from mid-October with the ducklings not being seen until December. We found some black neck swan, which are unusually flighty birds for, for, for Falkland birds and will simply fly away when approached. So we didn't. And usually the southern rockhopper colony here was not high on the cliffs but on a slope with a relatively easy trip through the sand and rocky outcrops down to the sea. But that didn't give them an easy life because there were the usual scavengers but in abundant evidence including this brown skewer reminiscent of our great skewer our bonksy just waiting for an opportunity to present itself. The scavengers were even fighting amongst themselves. Here, a brown skewer is trying to drive off the striated caracara. They were all very bold here and vicious, and I was certainly wary of sitting down to take photos. One interesting thing we did see was rockhoppers going into a pool in the rocks, presumably filled with rainwater, and cleaning their feathers before going into the sea. Given the importance of maintaining their feathers, this is apparently quite normal. Again, we have numerous other wildlife, including these sea lions, which were hauled out on a rocky outcrop, basking in the sun. It was too early for them to have moved to their breeding beaches that generally the sea lions breed in, go and breed in December. There was also the black crown night heron, which is the only resident heron in the Falklands. Here we have an adult in breeding plumage from a colony nesting in the tussock on the cliffside. And in actual fact, you can see the tussock grass on the top left. We also have this immature bird which is really quite different to the breeding plumage of the adults. The upland goose is a widely seen endemic subspecies. In November, there were many of these fluffy chicks with their parents. This species generally lays seven eggs, which suggests that this pair may have lost a couple of young. However, it's not unusual to see pairs with more young and sometimes of differing ages. And that really comes about where they have in effect stolen young from other pairs, which is something this species seems to do. There were plenty of two banded plover, like 
plovers that we see. They run away when approached and they do the broken wing display to attract attention away from the nest or the young. The snowy sheathbill is a migrant here. It is an attractive and very white bird, which somewhat surprisingly is a scavenger that feeds on invertebrates and carrion. We also saw a number of variable hawk on the island, including in a tree beside the lodge, and this one with some carrion, which looks to me like a lamb. These are widespread on the archipelago. These two birds were in a tree in the garden of the lodge. While I particularly enjoyed the lovely long-tailed meadowlark up the top, the less brightly coloured shiny cowbird attracted most of the attention as it was an unusual migrant from South America. It isn't possible to go to the Falkland Islands without being reminded of the Falklands War, but probably no more so than here on Pebble Island, where there are pieces of an Argentinian fighter plane shot down by a sea harrier. The pilot, I believe, ejected and came back to visit many years later. The Cairn, to commemorate the raid by the SAS on the 15th of May 1982, which resulted in the destruction of 11 Argentinian aircraft stationed here and was the first step in the liberation of the islands. The remains of some of those planes are also still there. And the memorial to those who unfortunately lost their life when HMS Coventry sank nearby. Although divergent slightly, I must mention what a momentous week it has been for the Falkland Islands as they have been declared landmine free. Last weekend, local people were able to go onto the beaches at York Bay and Gypsy Cove for the first time in nearly 40 years. The Zimbabwean demining team has done a wonderful job completing the exercise three years ahead of schedule. And then we moved on to Bleecker. Bleecker was originally called Long Island, presumably from its shape, and is referred to as such on the chart compiled by the 1834 survey of which Charles Darwin was part. It then became Breaker after the large waves that crash against it. This picture actually I think that's relatively small ones. Then Bleecker, although it's not bleak, even if we did have our wettest weather of the trip here one day, but another haven for wildlife. On our arrival, we were taken to Sandy Bay to see an unusual visitor, a large female leopard seal. This is the second largest of all the seals, some 11 feet long, and is normally found in the colder climes of the Antarctic. They tend to live alone or in small groups. They get their name from the black spotted coat, although it's actually quite difficult to see it there. But that's not where the resemblance to the leopard ends. They are considered to be the most aggressive of the seals and the only species of seal which, which feeds on warm bloody prey, such as other small seals and penguins. We were surprised to be told about a penguin hut and kill that our fe fellow travelers had witnessed while, a while before, as we were again the second group to travel. However, as we watched the leopard seal, Bill spotted a young sea lion in the shallows, and so did the leopard seal, who was clearly still hungry, and so set off like a torpedo after it, catching and killing it. The seal then disappeared for 24 hours, presumably to digest such a large meal. However, this unusual visitor is a double-edged sword for the island. It is an attraction for visitors, certainly, but it's also a risk to the other wildlife. As we've already seen, it was hanging around the beach from which certain of the Gentoo colonies enter the sea. They had to pass the seal in both directions, both going out to feed and coming back. Oops. 
So, you know, it is quite a risk. And in actual fact, the birds, the leopard seals stayed for a couple of months. Unfortunately for the Gentoo, both partners are required for a successful nest. One partner cannot both brood the eggs and feed itself. So if for any reason the bird's mate doesn't return, it has no choice but to abandon the nest to feed and survive itself. Which is what happened here, as the bird on the left side there has just got up from its nest and the brown skewer was then straight in to take the eggs. There's no saying that the leopard seal was to blame in this instance, as penguins face many challenges going out to sea, but this is, was our first penguin species a year ago today. Our second was the Magellanic, picking their way through the rocks and down onto the beach, and here passing a flock of South American tern. The tern are a widespread summer resident and are quite distinctive with their black caps, their blood red legs and bill and the long streamers from the tail. The black and white birds you see here in amongst them are not a different species, but first year birds who haven't yet got their breeding plumage. Also on the beach was another resident, the dolphin gull, one of the world's most beautiful gulls. With that dove gray body, dark red bill, red eye ring and legs. In the late 1990s, it was estimated that the Falklands had half the world's population. Our third penguin of the day was the rock copper. Here, as before, nesting on the cliff top. They get their name by hopping or bounding with both feet together up and down the cliff face, using their bill for support in difficult places. It is amazing to watch them work their way down the sea down to the sea and just jump into these rough waters. But it's even more impress impressive to see them coming back. They swim around for a while, presumably waiting for the right conditions, and then launch themselves onto the rocks. Scramble their way up to safety and then dry off before climbing all the way back up the cliffs. The fourth species of the day, which we had hoped we might see, was the macaroni penguin. It's similar to the rock hopper, but larger, with distinctive golden orange head plumes. They're rare on the Falkland Islands, but odd pairs do nest amongst the rock, rock hoppers, or Sometimes one takes a rock hopper for a mate, as here. Surprisingly, their offspring will be fertile. Over our fifth species of the day, which we've already seen, was a surprise. This king penguin was discovered on the beach in the late afternoon, having come ashore with the Gentoo, rather than returning to its own colony on another island. He stayed overnight before heading off. So we were very lucky to do the Falcons equivalent of the big five, um, which is pretty rare. The island is also important for its colonies of cormorants with over 8,000 imperial cormorant in the main breeding colony. This is an impressive bird with a bright blue eye ring the large orange knobs above the base of the bill. And in the early breeding season, it has that untidy black crest. In November, it is just starting to nest, collecting vegetation from the local diddle dee. Although southern sea lions do not breed here, we were lucky enough to see a colony hauled out on the beach prior to moving to their breeding territories in December, alongside a few elephant seals hiding at the back there. The sea lion gets its name from the thick neck of the male, which when dry, resembles a mane. Despite not being a breeding beach, 
the male was chasing away the younger males, like this one in the foreground, which were trying to sneak into the females and thus protecting his females. Again, I mustn't forget the flora and there was some particularly nice lady slipper showing. Lastly, but definitely not least, Sea Lion Island. Sea Lion Island is a national nature reserve and the most southerly inhabited island of the Falkland archipelago. The island is very diverse with 40 species of breeding birds, two types of breeding seals and 56 flowering plants. There are several Gentoo colonies on the island, some of which we can see here. Plus one, which is right beside the lodge, literally, and which had a few young chicks. On the sea line, the Magellanic penguins are less concerned by people, perhaps as many of them choose to nest close to the path to the beach. The adults have a distinctive black and white band on the head, neck and breast, and a stout grey bill with pink around the eye. Their local name is Jackass, purely as their call sounds just like a braying donkey. In November, they'll be sitting on eggs, having returned to breed in September and laid from mid-October. So they were regularly around the burrows or sitting just inside watching. To get down to the sea, they pick their way through the tussock grass and the elephant seals. The sharp eyed amongst you will notice there's, there's a rather large camera here. Magellanic did also happily go around and between any people who happened to be there. It was the elephant seals that worried them. And on one occasion, they came through the people, no problem, not a second thought, and spent ages trying to pick a route through the elephant seals. Eventually, presumably decided there wasn't a safe one and came back all the way through and headed back up into the grass. Amongst the other wildlife on sea line are the striated caracara. While resident, it has declined through human persecution and is now only found much less. It is a charismatic, charismatic Johnny Rook, which is its local name, and will investigate anything unusual, including people with packed lunches. Albeit found here, particularly here and on Carcass, there are only some 1,500 to 2,000 birds worldwide. The tussock bird is considered an endemic locally and is also known as the blackbird. And it rather likes people to turn stones over for it so it can get at the tasty morsels below. The South American snipe is a widespread resident. This day, we kept finding them as we walked along. So I took a photo of the obliging bird. Then the next one we met was a bit closer. So repeat, and again, and again. So completely different from our own snipe, which would just fly away. There is also this particularly spectacular imperial cormorant colony on the cliff top. So different from the one on Pebble Island, which was inland. And indeed, they were literally nesting amongst the puddles in the rocks. Again, turning to the flora, there is this native scurvy glass, and we did find this in bloom. It gets its name as each part of the plant is edible and rich in vitamin C. And so it was used by the sailors to treat scurvy. Sea lion of an island doesn't, do, sorry, does have sea lions breeding around the coast, but they don't come on shore until December. So there weren't any there when we were there. However, it does hold a large percentage of the Falklands Islands Southern elephant seal population. And I think in 2019, they estimated that the island had in excess of 2,400 individuals, with over 600 pups being born. This population has been monitored since 1995 by the Elephant Seal Research Group, 
which is an independent organisation of researchers dedicated to the study of elephant seals. About a week and a half ago, they returned to the island for the 2020 study work. However, with the females already having left, this must affect the surveying. The males arrive in September to claim the beaches, followed by the females. After pupping and feeding the young for around 23 days, the female then mates and leaves the seat for the sea, having spent an average of just 27 days on the beach. So in late November, males of all ages were still on the beach molting, including the alpha male or beach master from the season just ending. I think basically he was having a rest after a very hard time. There were other males and younger males still fighting. And in actual fact, you can see here, there's quite a few marks on these seals from their escapades. In addition, yearlings and non-breeders will be coming on shore to molt. Lastly, the current year's weaned props or weaners, as they're usually referred to, will have grown to perhaps four times their birth weight and have been left on the beach by their mother until they're ready to take the sea. Each pub, pup is tagged by the ERSG as part of their study. And you can see the tag on the pup's tail and indeed here on this one too. It's this time of year that the killer whales come into the shallows to hunt. The killer whale is a striking black and white mammal, the largest member of the dolphin family, which we probably all have seen on documentaries. They're pack hunting predators, and it appears they got their name as early observers tell them whale killers after watching some of the populations hunting marine animals. These whales are studied all around the world, and it seems that different pods have developed different lifestyles and hunting techniques. In the southern hemisphere, the killer whales hunt penguins and pinnipeds, such as seals, sea lion, walruses. While filming for the BBC series Life, Hunters and Hunted, in the mid 2000s, the filmmakers discovered that in addition to catching seals at sea, one of the pods had learned how to come into the pools to catch the wieners. Or more accurately, one of the females, Puma, had learned this. <coughs> she has since taught her daughter Tanzino. This has now been filmed a number of times. And while we were on the island, there were two film crews, one of which was from National Geographic for a new upcoming series on whales. Hence that very large camera we saw earlier. The technique that Puma developed is to swim into the pool at high tide and catch an unsuspecting wiener who is practicing swimming in the shallows. So basically the whale comes in this gap up here and hopes to catch one of these guys if they're into a deep enough part of the channel. And here we have Tazina, which we can tell from that nick in the tail, or in, sorry, in her fin, coming in to patrol. However, she was ultimately unsuccessful, as although there's a number of wieners there, they're all very much on the edges where it's too shallow for her to approach. And As you can tell, we did see the whales. We went to the pools at dawn each morning and on the second day were lucky enough, or not depending on your point of view, to watch several chases, three catches over a three hour period. So if you're squeamish, this might be the point to look away. Both the filmmakers and the ESRG had drones up recording the activity, which you can see at the top here. The pod is made up of Puma and her four young of various ages. And here you can clearly see the seal they've caught. The ESRG researchers suggested that Puma and Tazina were teaching the younger members of the pod to hunt, as here you can see that the smaller, younger whale has been given the sea seal. You can actually just see it there. 
I'm actually told that on one of those, it was over half an hour between the catch and the kill. The seal then, thankfully, is put out of its misery and the birds, in particular the giant petrels, come in for the leftovers. For anybody who is interested in killer whales, the ESRG has been monitoring them and their effect on the elephant seal population since 2013. They've recently put a revised photo identification catalogue on their website, I suspect what they were doing during lockdown, along with the drone footage. This includes footage from this year, as Puma's family was first seen back on the island last Sunday, a little earlier than last year. And although that is all the islands that we visited, we did also go to Volunteer Point. So this was the final highlight of our trip. Volunteer Point is a privately owned nature reserve named after the ship Volunteer, which called at the islands in 1815. It's an impressive peninsula in the north of the East Island. While there are a number of species of birds here for which it is a site of conservation significance. For the visitor, the focus is the King Penguin Colony at Volunteer Beach, which is there all year round. This is perhaps the most accessible colony in the whole world, being around a two and a half hour drive from Stanley, the capital of the Falkland Islands. Over half of this involves some interesting off-road driving or native camp driving, as the locals would say, through the Diddle Dee, peat bogs and over mini streams, while the drivers move informal little bridges, bits of wood, around as required. It was quite good fun, actually. As you can see here, Edinburgh Zoo has been working in conjunction with Falklands Conservation and has helped provide the signage. Included here are the rules to protect the colony. These are necessary as on cruise ship days there could be 200 people here. So you are only allowed to visit for a couple of hours and must give the penguin space. On cruise ship days, this involves staying behind the ropes to keep out of both the colony and their routes to and from the water. However, the rest of the time, the requirement is to remain outside the white stones. We can see those up on the left there. Unfortunately, as in so many of these things, nobody's told the penguins and they were well distributed outside. The king penguin is at the northern edge of the range here. The colony has about 1,500 breeding adults with 600 to 700 chicks raised each year. The breeding cycle of the king penguin lasts for over a year, so a pair will only raise two chicks every three years. November is the beginning of the summer, and so the adults who hadn't bred the previous year were returning, and last year's very large chicks were molting and getting ready to depart for the sea for the next three to five years which meant there was some interesting activity going on, including pairs rebonding. There was some egg laying, although it was only a few and right in the center of the colony. There were molting youngsters milling about. They had been together in creches throughout the winter. And as you can see here, they're in various degrees of molting. So this guy here right in front hasn't started but the guy on the left is well on his way. But they will beg from anything which passes them, be it a penguin or a person. The colony is constantly moving about. Not least as the penguins go into and out of the water. This colony has the sea on one side and Volunteer Point Lagoon on the other. In the winter, the birds can embark on foraging trips as far as the Antarctic, returning only infrequently to feed the chick. However, in the summer, there's sufficient food locally. They approach the beach in groups, often in lines, <clears throat> but they are very cautious. And they've good reason to be, as they have dangers to face. Although the largest and indeed the most striking of the Falkland Island penguins, they are also predated. Sea lions, particularly bulls, can patrol the beach to catch the birds returning from fishing. 
King penguins are very slow on land, particularly in the transition to upright. So the technique seems to be to chase them as they come out of the water and before they stand up. As the sea lion is faster, it hopes to catch the penguin. However, I'm pleased to say, although we were able to witness a chase, no penguin was hurt as it returned safely to the colony. <clears throat> On the other side of the colony is Volunteer Lagoon. Here we saw the penguins swimming, washing, preening to clean those important, or get those important feathers ready, and drying themselves in the sun. As it happens, we did see a sixth type of penguin on our travels, thanks to the lodge at Pebble. I hope you've enjoyed this flavour of the Falkland wildlife in November. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Catherine. That was wonderful. And, uh, well, the, uh, are there any questions? Um, there's nothing come in in the Q&A or in the chat room so far. But um, does anybody have a question, um, comment? Uh, Nick, you may want to unmute people as they, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking into that, yeah. Yeah, some nice thanks very much comments so far. But, um, yeah, one question coming in. No. Okay, well, I, again, if there are no questions uh, coming in on that, again, I'm getting some wonderful comments here. Great photos. Thanks for sharing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Catherine. And it was, it was great. Um, very, very good indeed. So thank you very much indeed for, uh, for giving us that splendid talk. Um, right, if there are no other questions, and, and again, I'll pass on these um, uh, comments to Catherine uh, I, in terms of you're getting some great, great feedback, Catherine. Okay, thank you very much, folks. I, th I think we've got, we've got a couple of questions coming in now. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, just, I can just see. Uh, do you know what level of, uh, Peter Roberts has asked, what level of legal protection do the various animals oh, yeah. have? There's lots of different protections. I mean, the, the Sea Lion Island is a nature reserve in its, in its own right. Um, there are other bits of nature reserve. The Falklands Conservation actually owns quite a few of the smaller islands out there, um, the uninhabited ones. Uh, and I think it's different bits for different things. There's some of the, bur some of the areas are of special science interest for some of the birds. Um, there are quite a few different levels at different places, I think, would be the okay. simplest answer. Yeah, and there's another question from Laura asking us, are there any, did you, were they, did you see any effects of climate change or were that much discussed? Um, it's quite funny, on one of the planes we were on, we actually got talking to a girl who was part of a project out there um, reviewing climate change and because of because the Falkland Islands if you like are so early on in the climate change process because they don't have all the industrialization and in that they're actually using them as one of the uh, places to actually do a chunk of this testing I can't remember the details but uh, so they they are they are doing I mean, some of these are at the edge of their um, their range, for example, the king penguin. And therefore, yes, there is concern and people are watching to see whether or not these colonies will reduce. I mean, as I said in the talk, rock hoppers have reduced quite a bit, but it, it's not just at the Falklands, it's elsewhere. And I think people are trying to determine why, whether that's climate change, food, whatever. Uh, we do have another question from um, Yvonne. Uh, what breed of sheep were at the beginning of your talk? Any ideas? That's a very good question, Yvonne. I was trying to work that out too. And it didn't look to me like the native one, so I didn't say. 
And we've got another question from uh, Douglas. Uh, what is the best month to visit the Falklands to see most wildlife? Possibly, well, it depends what you want to see because you will see different things at different times. Um, November is a very good one, obviously, for the birds that are starting to nest. So it's a bit like in Scotland. If you want the seabirds and things, you would go in the likes of May or June because that's when the nesting's happening. And similar is true uh, down you know, in the Falklands for the same time. Certainly, if you want to see that killer whale activity, I think there is only a few weeks that they actually tend to do that. Obviously, if you go a bit later, for example, December, you're more likely to have chicks or young on the rockhopper colonies will have, I think by December, chicks. So I think, I think it depends what you want. And if you look at a number of the wildlife sites, they'll actually tell you what you would expect to be there in the different months. And a nice comment here from Jane. Um, she was born in the Falklands in Darwin and uh, lived in Port Stanley. She used to walk to school with penguins. So <laughs> that's exactly what you were seeing. Yeah. And there's, a, there's another question uh, from David, who's uh, asking, uh, first of all, complimenting you and the qualities of your photos, uh, but also saying, yep. were, were, uh, were you really that close or do you have a decent telephoto lens? Um, I have a, I have a semi-decent telephoto lens, but yes, we were that close. Um, there aren't any people photographs in this, but, you know, I have got, for example, some of the king penguins that are beside people because they just, you know, you don't need to go to them. You stand there and they, you know, that youngster just comes and sees if you'll give it some food. The adults just walk past. And the same is true to a lot of them. I mean, we were sitting the, the photograph with the uh, eating the penguin biscuit. You know, we're sitting at the edge of the beach. And when we sat down, I don't think any of the penguins were actually coming that way. They were going up one of the other paths. And then as we sat there, they seemed to use paths that got closer and closer to us. So yeah, both. <laughs> Okay, I don't see any other comments or questions coming in. Uh, Nick, do you see any? No, uh, just for me as an appreciation, given how remote they seem to us up here, uh, what do you make of life on, in the Falklands? Would you move there or would you, because it, it seems a lot of similarities was here, but equally there's this, this, this element of it being quite isolated. Yes, I, th I think it was a lovely place to visit. I really liked the Falklands. You never know, I might even get back there one day. And there were quite a lot of similarities, not so much to the mainland, not to, you know, Edinburgh or that, but I felt to the islands and the, that, that I've been to in Scotland before. Um, but I think it was Jane, was it, who said she'd stayed there. She's probably a better place to answer. Yeah. Um, I got the impression that winter is probably quite wild and uh, there. Um, and it is very remote. Mm. I mean, it does feel like a little bit of Britain because everything is, you know, very British, but on the islands were fantastic. But even the outlying islands, so for example, Carcass, which is the first island we visited and indeed Sea Lion, they are actually only occupied part of the year. They're not occupied in the winter. They do actually, everybody comes off the islands and moves in to the mainland, or well, not all the islands, but quite a number of them. So it's quite a unique way of life, I suspect. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. Lots of good comments, um, excellent talk, um, much appreciated. So anyway, well, thank you very much indeed, Catherine. That really was wonderful. Yeah, thank you very and, much. Uh, excellent photographs and uh, a good advertisement for uh, the Falklands. Um, right, well, thank you, Catherine. And next month, we'll have another talk. Um, this will be about the living seas, and it's about Scotland's marine treasure. And it's going to be presented by Dr. Sam Collins of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. 
And that will be, oh, I've forgotten, I think it's the 17th of uh, the month, just a minute, and I'll double check that. Um, yes, the 17th of December. We don't have a talk in January, but we have got talks planned for uh, February, the 18th of February and the 18th of March. The talk in March, the 18th of March has been confirmed. It will be about beavers in Scotland. Uh, and the other talk in February, we're still trying to get finalization on that, but we're hoping to have somebody from the Inner Forth Landscape Initiative give us a talk on that. But uh, nothing in January. So uh, the next talk, as I say, will be 17th of uh, December uh, on the Living Seas. So I think that was it for tonight. Uh, Nick, anything else to add? No, just uh, my appreciation and my thanks again to, to Catherine for, for, yeah. for the talk. Thanks for coming forward. Yes, thank you very much indeed. And we'll see you all again on the 17th of December. Thank bye. you very much. Okay, bye for now.